many people have worked for a long time, but there is one person here who for the past 365 days has been preparing for this day. Uh, one who thinks about this incredible gathering, one who thinks about who are the speakers, the ones who are the witnesses, the ones who are the experienced, the ones who have lived this era and are bringing it to us. And no one knows that world any better and is more suitable to introduce our guest today than Brother Ron Silver. When Mrs. Evers was the first woman to give the invocation at a presidential inauguration, Senator Schumer introduced her start to finish in 16 seconds. He was from New York, and I'm going to take a little longer. <laughs> but I'm going to have to do something a little different this evening. See, in the past, when introducing Dave Dennis, Rabbi Cy Dresner, and Congressman John Lewis, we've started by discussing the speaker's long criminal histories. <laughs> With Mrs. Evers, I cannot do that. Instead, I can tell you that Mrs. Evers spent 30 years making sure that a criminal finally did go to jail. It was late June 1963, when I was 12 years old, that my dad brought home a copy of Life magazine with a cover photograph of Mrs. Evers, taken at the funeral of her husband, Medgar Evers. My dad and I had a long talk then about Medgar Evers, what he'd been doing in Mississippi, and why heroes get killed. To be a child of the 60s was to experience great men being shot down, and Medgar Evers was the first that I experienced. 12 years before that issue of Life magazine, a young Myrtle Beasley went off to college at Alcorn a and in her home state of Mississippi and immediately forgot all the warnings she'd received from her grandmother and aunt about those older World War II vets going to school on the GI Bill. Medgar Evers could do that to you. Soon they were married and she was at his side a few years later in his role as NAACP field secretary struggling to change Mississippi. A struggle that would end for him with an assassin's bullet in June 1963. After two failed attempts to convict Medgar's killer, and now the widowed mother of three children, she moved to California to start a new life. Fortunately for us, Mrs. Evers kept engaged. She wrote a beautiful, heartbreaking memoir of her life, her life with Medgar entitled For Us the Living. She entered the corporate world as National Director for Community Affairs for ARCO. And in 1987, she became the first African-American woman commissioner on the Los Angeles Board of Public Works. During all this time, she never stopped seeking justice for Medgar. And in 1994, the ghosts of Mississippi gained a certain peace when a third jury finally convicted her husband's killer for murder. By then, Mrs. Evers had remarried to Walter Williams and moved to Bend, Oregon to retire in what we all know as paradise. <laughs> but personal tragedy struck again as Mr. Williams passed away from cancer. Yet it was then that Mrs. Evers took on one of her greatest challenges, becoming chairperson of the NAACP and returning this essential organization to greatness. After her three-year term, and with the NAACP again solvent, she stepped down. She has since returned to Jackson, Mississippi, and founded the Medgar and Murley Evers Institute with the mission to cultivate social change and economic justice. And in December 2012, along with Cantor Kahana, Thomas Lauderdale, and Pink Martini, Mrs. Evers made her debut performing at Carnegie Hall. And 
month after that, she delivered the invocation at President Obama's second inauguration. She is the embodiment of her concluding words from that morning. Mrs. Evers spoke of the spirit of the grandmothers when she said, there is something within me that holds the reins. There's something within me that banishes pain. There's something within me I cannot explain. But all I know, America, there is something within. There is something within. Oh, Lord, there certainly is. It is my honor and privilege to introduce Mrs. Murley Evers. friendship and the strength that you have given to me, even though you were not aware of that over the years. It has been a struggle, but it has been a righteous struggle. It has been one of which I feel honored to have carried. And as I sat on the stage and took in all of the goodness of this meeting and of the people here, I sent up a prayer of thanks that I was here and that my spirit was being renewed while all of us were being renewed as well. I often think of my grandmother, who was a deeply religious person, and she always said to me, and I quote, baby, you mustn't give up on what you believe in. Baby, you must be strong enough to tackle those things that seem impossible. Baby, always put your hand in his hand and you will be all right. Only believe. When I walked in this beautiful edifice tonight, I told my daughter, and I have to say this, she is one of the joys of my life. And I have to say joys because I have a son out there who might hear what I'm saying <laughs> and will ask why he wasn't included. But she said to me, it's going to be all right. Because I said, I don't know what I'm going to say. <laughs> Feeling a little weary, I did what my grandmother always told me to do, and that was to ask for help, and to ask for guidance. I was so blessed to have had that woman and my aunt in my life. I was so blessed to have the people in my neighborhood who cared about each and every child that walked through, of my teachers, of their friends who always said to we poor little girls, don't worry, you can be somebody. Long before the saying I am somebody came before us all. You can become weary, you can become tired. But when you believe in something, 
such as justice and equality, do you ever stop the pursuit of those things? And my answer is no. I was very fortunate to have Medgar Evers in my life, and he still is. His spirit still guides me, and it will continue to do so until I take my last breath. I was so fortunate to have another man in my life by the name of Walter Williams, who believed so firmly in Medgar and his work that he said he saw us on television the day after Medgar's assassination and he said, God, I'd like to be able to take care of that man's family. And I told him later when we met, be careful what you ask <laughs> because you just may get it. I said all of that to say this. I am so blessed. I cannot count my blessings. And I am blessed to be in this building with each and every one of you. Because I find a strength, I find a reason for continuing to work. To work in the vineyards of peace, reconciliation, hope, and of course, love. I was asked, how can you possibly feel that way when things happen to you? Now, I stand before you very much a human being with aches and pains and good feelings and even occasionally hatred. And it's interesting how hatred can fuel a fire to help turn things around in another direction. But how long do we hate? How long do we despise? without damaging ourselves and others around us. So I stand before you tonight. Thank you. I stand before you tonight saying, I am blessed beyond anything I could ever imagine. It has not been easy. And I came here tonight weary and tired. And I said to my beautiful daughter, what on earth am I going to say? Will I have five minutes? Will I have 10 minutes? And she gave me that look that said, you'll take as long as you want. <laughs> but I promise not to bore you tonight, at least I hope I don't. But behind all of the things that I have been able to do has been my belief in someone, in something much larger, much stronger, much wiser than I, you, or anyone else could be. Tired and weary, and I said, what on earth am I going to say? What am I going to address? Am I going to talk about Martin Luther King Jr. tonight? Or am I going to speak to all of the other people who have given so much in the pursuit of justice and equality? That would take too long tonight. But I do want to share this with you. I have said, I'm tired. I'm weary. I can't go on. I don't want to go on. And you walk into the house of our beloved Savior, and you come in contact with his children, and all of a sudden something rises up, and this little light of mine and all of those other things come together. And you realize truly that that is what life is about. I said to my daughter, I don't know what I am going to say. And she said, don't worry about it, Mom. You always find something to say. 
So I want to be honest and open with you tonight, very briefly. And to say to you that at this point in my life, I am concerned. I am concerned about where we are in this United States of America. I am concerned about where we are in this world of ours. Because all we have to do is read our newspapers of a few weeks, few months, and ask the question, where are we going? It makes no difference whether it is in Paris, France, and terrorism has taken over that place to the point where they've even had to shut down the beloved tower. We can go in parts of Africa and find that young girls are being snatched from their homes and taken off and sold as sex slaves. We can go to Britain and look at the rumors and all of the things that are going on there. We can look at Ebola that's taking over parts of this world. We can look here at home and we can see that we still have so much yet to do as we sing the Star Spangled Banner, as we sing all of those other songs that are patriotic and all that say that we believe in justice and equality. And every once in a while, you too probably react as I do, you become a little weary of it all. But it means one thing, as my grandmother said, it means that you must act. And one of her favorite sayings was, you can sit on the fence only so long and you get pretty sore. <laughs> and you have to get up and you have to move and you have to move on those things that you belong and that you believe in. And America, I look at you. I look at our country. And with all of the things that we have been through from slavery to today, and we see so much yet must be done. I think of all the things that are happening recently. I hope I'm not sitting in judgment I am, but I'm not going to share it with you. <laughs> but I think about the police who turn their backs on city officials. I'm not going to argue as to whether they have a reason for doing that or not. But there's a certain thing about respect of those <laughs> must be able to move forward in addressing all the ills of our society. Martin Luther King Jr. was not the only one who said that. There were others who not as brilliant as he, but who worked and who spoke and who lived that life. I look at what is happening in Ferguson and other parts of this United States of America, and I have to ask the question, is there a war on young black males? I cannot help but feel that way because I see the evils there are. I look at our educational systems throughout this country and where monies that should be put there for the education of our children are going elsewhere. I think about our neighborhoods with our children who are faced daily with having to or wanting to sell dope and ruining the minds of so many bright and brilliant people that could take us forward. And I can go on and on and on about what is wrong in American society. 
But you know as well as I do what those issues are. The question is, what are we as individuals and as groups going to do about it? Are we simply going to protest? Are we simply going to come together and try to find solutions? And are we going to be serious about doing that? Because my friends, it's basically left up to us. We can no longer point the fingers at others and say it is his fault, it is her fault. Some way we have to find a way of coming together and addressing the problems that we have in this country. I look at the prejudice and racism within our own government and it's like, no, no, no. You really shouldn't do that. But I want to go back a couple of years when President Obama was delivering his State of the Union address. And off to the side, one of the legislators called out in a very loud voice, you lie, you lie. Nothing was ever done about that. You tell me, regardless of whether you like someone's policies or not, isn't there respect due for the head of this country? If we expect to be appreciated and respected around this world, of course we are going to disagree. But where is that spirit of coming together and working as one unit? Because what my fear is, is that my grandchildren and great-grandchildren to come will be living in a world that is torn by war and by strife. We celebrate Dr. King, all that he stood for. We praise him for what he did and others who gave of their life, of their being. Yet we do it in one or two meetings, sessions, and then it's over and done with it. We can't allow that to happen, my friends. I stand here thankful and proud to be almost 82 years of age. And I have seen so much, I'm proud of it too. I might need a cane. I might need a pain pill or two. I might look in the mirror and see a few wrinkles and gray hairs. But I always say, you cool girl. <laughs> because time is not up yet. Our time is still here, my friends. And I think about Dr. King and all of the others, but particularly Dr. King now. And I saw the movie. It was the closest thing to the truth that I have seen. And I hope our children of all races, creeds, and colors will be able to see that movie. To see the humanness in the man, the strength that he had, the weaknesses that he had, and how People of all races, creeds, and colors came together to send a message to the United States of America that we are of this country regardless of the race, creed, or color, and we stand up to say this is our country and we are claiming it 
as ours and saying to others who don't feel that way, move over. Move over because we are coming through. So why not? Why not join hands? Why not join hearts and make this the greatest country we say it is? But why don't we make it the greatest country that this world has ever seen? I look, yeah, you may applaud. television shows, the nature shows, and the extraterrestrial shows. <laughs> and I find myself saying, mm-hmm, there is something out there. <laughs> what is it? My grandmother would say, darling, there's a force greater than each and every one of us. Be moved by that force to do good for each and every one. We praise Dr. King. We usually do it once a year. He and so many others should be included on a daily basis in the history of this great country. And of course, I can only think of Medgar Evers. who had no desire for any personal gain of his own. And as a young wife, I would say to him, well, what about us? What about me? What about the children? And he would answer, it is for you, our children, all of the other families in this country, regardless of race, creed, or color, as to why I'm doing what I can. I will share with you a vision that I had, and then I will sit down. <laughs> the state of Mississippi has a project of way, and it is to build a new civil rights museum by the year 2017. But they have some exhibits that I gave to the state that came from Medgar's repertoire. One was a rifle that was used to kill him. And in this room, I walked in and there was that rifle in plexiglass. I was stunned. But I saw it in three parts. The butt, and the trigger. The next part I envisioned was Medgar's body underneath that middle part, stretched out, but having done his work and being free. And the next part was the fire coming out of the end of that rifle. And to me, that meant freedom for everyone else because of what he did and because of, not gladly, but positively, he gave his life for a better country for all of us. I think about Dr. King. I think of the movie that is out. And it is perhaps, in my humble estimation, the best movie that I have seen regarding him and his life. My daughter and I were fortunate to be included with a group of people, old civil rights leaders, who met with Oprah Winfrey. And it was a joy for each of us to see each other, to count the number of gray hairs we had, to see if someone was dying those gray hairs, <laughs> <laughs> to see us on crutches and canes, <clears throat> of still being able to see through our bifocal glasses, <laughs> but a sense of humor, 
and strength for what all of us had been through and what we represented. It was a joyous occasion. But what was best was to see the children of all of those people there, determined to carry on the work of their parents and others. And in so seeing, you realize that yes, the work is not complete. But there's another generation coming behind us and another generation and another generation and another generation after that to move this country to being what it says it is, the land of the free and the home of the brave. I was born in Mississippi. I still have problems with Mississippi, but I'm there to help work those problems out. And I say to you, in the spirit of Dr. King, in the spirit of all of the others who gave so much to move us forward in this country, let us not forget their patience, their determination, and their commitment to make America what we say it is. A country of the free, of the home of the brave, and a country moving forward that will set the example for the rest of the world to follow. Is that impossible? No, it's not. Because with each and every one of you here, regardless of age, we can play some small role in seeing that that comes about. So I thank all of you for being patient with me and letting me expound on some things that are near and dear to me. But I am glad that I had a chance to come to this place and to share the spirit of hope, prosperity, and freedom with each and every one of you. I thank you.